So, five years ago, there was a lady who came in our office at the New York University, uh, at our lab, uh, at the Department of Cognitive Science and Psychology, and uh, asked us to help her. We were a little bit surprised because we had been doing, at the time, uh, fundamental research using eye tracking, bio recordings, uh, and other type of devices. But she said, we are the only people in Bulgaria who know something about eye tracking. And so her son had cerebral palsy and cannot use his hand, cannot uh, speak. And she said, you must help us because in Bulgaria nobody uh, cares about it, nobody knows about it. And so this actually changed our lives uh, three years later when we founded the NGO which uh, promotes and popularizes uh, eye tracking based uh, assistive technologies and also other high tech technologies in Bulgaria. And it was not planned in our lives uh, with a colleague of mine. And we are now crossing Bulgaria uh, and uh, doing campaigns, uh, seminars, and so on and so forth. And we saw uh, a lot of problems out there, but we met also wonderful people, wonderful children. Well, this is Dieter. Uh, who is the son of this lady. This is Alexander, who turned out to be the first user of such technology in Bulgaria starting nine years ago, but nobody could help him, so his family basically uh, was doing and is doing now what, what they can. Then Ami is a, a recent acquaintance of us, and it's a great pleasure, very inspiring for us, because she's extremely smart. And Angela Pencheva, who started with us from the very beginning because she's actress in the theater uh, at the New Bulgaria University for uh, disabled people. So she was the first to come into our office and she started writing right away using a night tracker. And what she wrote the first time was when people see me, they think that I don't have feelings and I don't have opinions. But this is not true. So it is very important for these people to have access to such type of assistive technologies. So this group of people, including the so famous and well known to you Stephen Hawking, uh, is a group of people with severe physical disabilities. Uh, some of these people are not so well cognitively, which is not a problem at all, but some of them are not only preserved cognitively, but are at the higher length of the IQ spectrum. And so Stephen Hawking is one of the famous users of uh, high technological assistive technologies using a muscle on his cheek and using a device with a scanning facility with which he can write, he can uh, tell us stories about black holes, about the universe, but also recently about the dangers of artificial intelligence. And so uh, people like that are really millions in the world. So this is just about disabilities, uh, more than 750 million globally, but of course these disabilities can also be minor, can be due to age, and so on and so forth. But still, there is a group of people, putting aside people uh, with blindness or deaf people, uh, there are a lot of diseases and conditions that uh, are unfortunately statistical, they can strike anybody, and some of them are related to accidents, so all of us can more or less be victims of it. And of course, we always age, and with age there are problems and disabilities coming. So you can see how many of them, so cerebral palsy, I mentioned it already, but also the autistic spectrum, the spinal cord injuries, which are due to accidents, to sport, like to car accidents, muscle dystrophy affecting children, uh, mostly uh, male children, and ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, the so-called Stephen Hawking's disease. So, put together, all these diseases give about 2% of the population. Only in Bulgaria there are 145,000 people with it. Fortunately, some of these disabilities are minor, but of course within this group there are at least 7,000 people approximately, which need assistive technology, advanced assistive technology, in order to be able to develop it all, to communicate with their parents and their uh, friends around. So, what is done in the field of assistive technology? There are, of course, prospects that 
are really out there. So, for instance, the prosthetic eye, which uh, is something developed by several companies. Uh, this one based on uh, the research, wonderful research by Shio Nirenberg, who, who cracked the code of sending signals between the human retina and the brain. So now this can be substituted by a camera doing the same job and, and doing really a very nice stuff. And more ubiquitous type of assistive technologies, like for instance this head tracker, where with movements of, of the head you can control a computer mouse, or if you cannot do that, you can put this into your mouth and you, with your tongue you can write a text or you can again control a computer or with your finger, the one that you can move, very often people can move just one finger, and the more fashionable and already on the market brain-to-computer interfaces, BCIs, that allow, as it's usually advertised, to write with your thought. It's not exactly like this, but still, this is something that allows people who cannot move even their eyes, unfortunately there are such cases, to write and communicate with others, uh, and uh, this is, of course, very important. For people who have uh, physical disabilities, there are solutions that are starting emerging, like the exoskeleton. So this one is within the Mindwalker project of the University of Twente. So it's controlled with eye gaze, so you can control your movement by moving your eyes, but also by a brain-to-computer interface where it can add, because this is for people who are fully paralyzed. So, in a sense, in order to make these movements, they need to have conscious commands about any of these movements. So, this is something that also is developed. More recently, cars for blind people. Of course, smart cars probably are better, but still, these cars transform signals from, from the environment into signals that blind people can perceive through, their, through these gloves and uh, through these special uh, devices that are mounted on them. And even more recently, enhanced learning by stimulating the brain based on the brain of people who have a skill. So you can stimulate a person who doesn't have this skill and improve very much uh, training and learning. So there are examples, although relatively rare, of people who, helped by such assistive technologies, can lead relatively normal lives. And Catherine Lemler is one such example. Uh, she uses a night tracking device which is mounted with a computer, which is mounted on her wheelchair. So she has a bachelor degree already. She's studying in a master's program. She has a website that she's uh, promoting assistive technology and consultancies for people uh, with disabilities. There are also uh, Sarah Ezekiel, who is a painter and she has uh, ALS, uh, Stephen Hawking's disease, and at some point she was completely paralyzed, she could not talk, but still continued to paint with her eyes, and you can follow her on Twitter and see uh, what she thinks about life. She's also selling her paintings and helps people with the same disease with uh, earnings from, from these uh, paintings. And Angela Pencheva, a Bulgaria, uh, who I mentioned, she's a writer. She wrote a book about her life in very difficult conditions, using just her left thumb. She could move with a lot of difficulties, but still she did it. She's really with uh, a huge wish to express herself. And at the same time, she's uh, an actress, and maybe the first actress in the world using uh, assistive device, night tracking. You can see her with a well-known Bulgarian actress, Jana Marinova, in a play that um, is based on her uh, autobiographical book, uh, My Life Having a Left Thumb. And you can see her working, demonstrating the capabilities of this eye tracker, which is here, following her eyes. So with her eyes, she's using this screen mouse. So for instance, she selected here scrolling. The scroll sign is here. When she looks up, she goes up. When she looks up under this sign, she goes down. So now she's trying to complete her high school studies because she couldn't do this when she was young. She's now 49. And she'll probably do it because she's doing this very systematically. And uh, here she shows all the capabilities of the eye tracking assistive technology, which is very mature at the moment. 
So uh, the price is not very high. You can basically work with Windows and all the software which is there. And there is also software which is adapted for people uh, uh, using their eyes because it's a little bit more difficult than using your hands. So I want just you to pay attention to this weight here with the rope. I don't know if, if you can see it. So it was used when she was typing with her left thumb because she needed to make key combinations, for instance, shift for capital letter or control. She just took this weight and put it on shift or on control and then pressed the respective button. And she wanted really to write correctly, so use capital letters, which, which is amazing. So this is Alexander I presented to you before. The first user who is a gamer, he's playing games, computer games, surfing uh, through the uh, web. But he has some difficulties in writing, so his parents are preparing some exercises for him. So his gaze is the red point that you see here and there. He's selecting an object here. It's pronounced. You can hear it here. And he must write it using the letters. So you see the gaze going here and there. This is the eye tracker. And after completing this, it's a difficult word because there are a lot of consonants in it. He will check it and then the, uh, the software will give him feedback about his achievements. And this is Ami who started working with such a device this year. And because her mother actually took care of her very, very well and she was trained on a tablet with her mother basically holding her hand and selecting different options, she started playing again. She's six, playing right at, at the beginning of being presented with this device. She's six years old. It turned out that she can count. She can write her name with her eyes using the keyboard. And we hope that she will be in general school next year because now she, she has such a device with her. So all these examples uh, are a little bit on the side of access to computer education, uh, profession, future profession, and so on and so forth. But be besides all these great opportunities that assistive technologies give, the right to communication is a central one. And uh, people who don't have these problems, they underestimate the possibility to express your feelings, to say that you disagree with something, and to be spoken to. Because sometimes people spoke to the assistants of these people because they think that if they cannot talk, they don't have any opinion or anything to say. So this is important. And of course, all this is already in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, where all the rights of people with disabilities uh, are expected to be granted. But of course, you know, to be able to uh, realize this in life, which is not the case, you need more powerful assistive technologies. And these more powerful assistive technologies, in general, must be based on the recent revolutionary advances in artificial intelligence and, and robotics, which are, some of them there, some of them are expected to occur. So these are all the brain projects, human brain projects, Google brain, that try to understand the human brain by simulating it. So there are some expectations that by 2050, the human brain will be understood at the molecular level. And so if this is the case, then some people already are prepared to be immortal in the future by uploading their consciousnesses into computers. And so one of these thinkers, Ray Kurzweil, who uh, coined down the term the singularity point, this is the point when AI will be as powerful as, uh, as the human mind, and so, at this point, the idea would be that instead of doing robots, which are potentially dangerous, probably we must enhance ourselves and achieve happiness by uh, superpowers that, that you might, we might have. And all this is great, so remember the, the timings, uh, but many people are afraid of this progress. And so recent studies show that 60% of people are scared of, this, scared of this huge development, including Stephen Hawking, who uh, in a sense, is interested in this, in this development. And movies uh, kind of sustain or express these fears of people in different forms. Uh, but let's come back to the documents, the strategies that exist right now about people with disabilities. 
So all these documents, they mention people with disabilities, their equal rights, and the idea that these people have the same rights as everybody else. But on the other hand, if you read these documents, you'll see that the assistive technologies are mentioned as something that, of course, is needed, should be there, but nothing else is mentioned. And it is obvious that it is not enough. And this is the case because there are models behind all these documents, models of disability, as they are said, as they are told. Uh, and these models start with the, with the medical model of disability, which is the first one, treating disabilities as diseases, as something that must be cured. Uh, these people as patients that uh, uh, require special institutions, segregations, and so on and so forth. So fortunately, this model is not more uh, used. And it, at first, it was substituted by the social model of disabilities, going a little bit to the other extreme and claiming that any disability is basically due to society which puts barriers in front of these people, so disabilities do not exist if you take some measures, if you have appropriate transportation, access, and assistive technologies. And nowadays there are more balanced models like the one of the World Health Organization, the biopsychosocial model, which accounts for all the spectrum of needs and conditions and situations, but of course it's not so widely used in practice. And also we have the so-called human rights model of disability that is behind the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. So, what is the next model? So, I would suggest, I would advocate for a so-called transhumanist model of disability, transhumanist coming from the idea of enhancing human capacities, which uh, is something that is coming. And of course, it seems that this is consistent with the opinion of Stephen Hawking uh, in another context. and. In order to do so, uh, what is needed, of course, is to formulate this model and to have the right documents so that at some point the people I mentioned today, like Annie, like Dieter, like Alexander, uh, have a future because now they are teenagers or, or children. So what will happen to them in 10 years or in 20 years? These are exactly the years of these achievements in AI that will be there, available. And so the idea would be that in order for them to benefit from, from it, all this type of work has to be done. This model, these models have to be formulated, these documents have to be changed, these strategies have to be changed. Because if we refer to what Ban Ki-moon said when he was Secretary General of UN some time ago for the strategy of the human development in the next 30 years, he said we are going on the right path and nobody will be left behind meaning people with disabilities. So I would say that in order for this transition to transhumanist to be <coughs> really humanistic, really successful, the people with disabilities must be put forward or at the center of these developments and all the strategies needed for that must be there based on transhumanist model of the disability. Thank you.